and welcome to our lesson on mechanism design. Uh, this to me is always one of the kind of more interesting lessons and sections and not necessarily the easiest to grasp but probably to me this could be the single most important thing in the whole course and I say thing, I mean we spend a lot of time on mechanism design in the remainder of the course and the ideas behind this. But up to now, what we've done, you know, I've given you a game, right? I, I, I give you some paragraphs, sometimes I'll write the payoff matrix or the decision, you know, the tree diagram for you, and you solve, right? It's perfectly fine, it exercises your logic. Um, you know, sometimes it's a set of instructions, you try to figure out what the game is, and that's perfectly good. But uh, a lot of time in life, that's not the way things work. A lot of times in life, you will want to have a certain outcome occur, and you'll have some power to set up rules for, we call it the game. You know, not really games, but you know the rules for whatever, the rules for your organization. Uh, you want to reach a desired outcome. What mechanism design does is kind of shows how do we set up the rules of the game to get to the Nash equilibrium that we want to get to, right? That you could set up the rules a whole bunch of different ways to get to a number, to get to a whole bunch of different Nash equilibria. How do we, how do we set up our game to get people to the outcome where we want them to be? Well, if we do that and we get the Nash equilibrium we're hoping for, we are engaging in mechanism design. I mean, where does mechanism ap design apply? Well, I think it applies everywhere. Any, I mean, if any of you are in student groups that have rules or bylaws, right? Why do you have the rules or the bylaws? And it's to encourage behavior, right? Some groups say you have to make certain, you have to make the meetings, or else you're you can't be part of the group, or there's some punishment. Why? You want people to show up to the meetings. If you didn't have that, those rules, you may not, uh, you know, people may not show up. Uh, you know, for a practical matter for any professor, how do we set up the rules of the course to get the maximum amount of effort from students? So the students learn as much as they can learn, you know, within the constraints that, you know, there's so much time, that, there's only so much time that they have. Right? That's, that's a big issue. Group projects are huge for this. How do you set up group projects where um, you're dealing with the proper incentives? Not an easy question. Right? All of this is mechanism design. So these games have certain rules to follow. Right? You're going to set up a particular game. There's going to be rules of the game. If you are designing a game or a mechanism, what you want is you want to get to a particular outcome. So as the professor of this course, right, I, I want you to show up to class. I want you to put in effort. I'm hoping you enjoy this as well. So uh, if I give a set of rules that gets everybody to put in you know, the most effort possible within reason, right? I know you have other classes and other activities. So. But I, I, you know, I want you to show up for class and I want you to spend time outside of class to participate in this. If I set up the rules for a course and it works and people put in the effort that I'm hoping, I have created what, what we call an incentive compatible mechanism. So incentive compatibility is the idea that you set up a mechanism and it gets you to the desired result. Um, a lot of the papers in this class uh, I'd say a lot. I mean, it's, it's not a majority, but a sizable percentage each year seem to be focused on incentive compatibility. One of the ones that I thought was one of my favorite ones, and uh, part of it, it was just kind of such a unique thing, and I, when I first heard of it, I'm like, really? You're going to do this? Uh, somebody looked at the rules for the bathrooms and the residence halls and mentioned, and several students agreed, that the bathrooms can often get rather disgusting. Um, and looked at the current set of rules and proposed alternative rules to try to get to um, an incentive compatible, you know, to get to an incentive compatible result, to have a mechanism that gets, makes everybody want to keep the bathrooms clean. Right, that, that's a game theory paper. And that was a very interesting and useful uh, way to incorporate game theory methods uh, into a final paper. 
So incentive compatibility is a concept that keeps coming up. The book suggests four steps for designing an incentive compatible mechanism. I think these are pretty good steps, so that's why we put them here. We start with an initial set of rules. If you are in a group and you want to have people show up to the meetings and spend an hour a week doing group work for whatever group you're working on, whatever group you have, you come up with some set of rules or bylaws. Uh, consider the rules, determine the Nash equilibrium given in the rules, and you suppose people act non-cooperatively. Right? People are not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because they, you know, this is, they want to be part of the group. They don't want to work as hard. They want to work as little as they can to still be part of the group. How do you do it? I suppose people act non-cooperatively. If the results are not satisfactory, right? If you try something, it doesn't work. You try something different. Um, very practical one for me is you're watching these videos. First time I taught these, um, I had a lot of, I had a number of students who didn't watch the videos and it was a struggle to figure out what to do. Um, I docked some attendance days, but that didn't seem to matter. So the change uh, early on in the semester, um, I have people show up uh, on, the, on the, one of the first days of class. And if you haven't watched the video, you don't get into class that day. That's a pretty severe penalty. And hopefully that is impressing upon people that it works. Um, if the results still aren't satisfactory, then you might have to try different rules. If they are, though, if the rules yield the appropriate Nash equilibrium, you suggest the rules are adopted. Now, that's if it's a committee. If it's just you, if you are unilaterally get to set the rules, um, then just adopt the rules. So how does this apply? Well, a lot of the rest of the semester is going to be on mechanisms, but uh, we're, our first example is going to be liability laws, and this is going to be kind of a part video, part in class work. So liability laws. So exercising caution requires effort. We're economists. We put monetary values on disutility from being careful. We can put monetary values on anything, right? We've put a, discussed the monetary value of a life before. If somebody's not careful, they're far more likely to cause damage. So the problem here, some people don't want to be careful because that takes effort. But if you're not careful, you're more likely to cause damage. Well, that can lead to a problem. So what about a game with a motorist and a pedestrian where there's no liability laws? Um, if there's no liability laws, well, if it takes effort for the motorist, the question is, is the motorist going to incur a cost if the motorist hits the pedestrian? Well, maybe, but it's not a very big cost, right? Um, so that may not yield the result you want if there are no liability laws. Like, right, if you could wipe out a pedestrian, it just doesn't matter. You know, you're not going to pay anything. It matters to the pedestrian, of course. But you're driving, you know, you're texting, eating a burger, um, listening to the radio, or watching TV, or you know, a DVD or something, all at the same time, and you hit somebody. Um, you just keep driving, right? That's not going to yield. That's not going to lead to the amount of care we would hope. So we're going to formalize this in class, right? We're going to put out a payoff matrix with various numbers, but we're going to, I'm going to just for now write out the three alternative laws that we're going to consider, and I want you to get those down. Then in class, we can jump through to each of these. Um, so instead of no laws, what are some alternative mechanisms that could be put into place? One of them is strict liability. The motorist is at fault for any accident and must make the pedestrian whole. That's a possible law. If there's an accident, the motorist is at fault, must make the pedestrian whole. That's called strict liability. Another one, negligence and contributory negligence. The motorist must compensate the pedestrian for any accident where the motorist wasn't careful, but the pedestrian was. So the pedestrian was being cautious, the motorist wasn't. This is widely used in the US, right? If, um, if you are, texting and talking on your phone. Um, at the same time, I guess that might take two phones. Well, no, maybe not. But, uh, and um, watching you know, a Blu-ray at the same time that you're driving and you hit somebody who was being careful, you are going to have to pay to make the pedestrian whole, right? The monetary amount of any of their physical damages. Okay, 
it's strict liability and contributory negligence. If both exercise due care and an accident happens anyways, the motorist bears the cost, right? Some percentage of the time, you're being careful, pedestrians being careful, you're driving, but a tire blows out, car veers, and you hit the pedestrian, right? That can happen. Uh, or an icy road and it slips. Well, the motorist bears the cost. Even though both were careful, the motorist would bear the cost. When we set this up in class, and I'm writing this down, so you, if you want, you can go ahead and try to put together the payoff matrix on payoff matrices, because there's really going to be four of them, one with no laws and then with one of the, each of the various laws. Suppose that the effort to be careful costs 10 units, right? To be careful costs you 10 units. Being hit costs 100 units. Being hit's not fun. Um, if either person isn't careful, we assume the pedestrian gets hit. So if either the pedestrian or the motorist or both aren't careful, we assume the pedestrian will be hit. If both are careful, the pedestrian's hit 10% of the time. So you're going to have to use expected values on this one. What I'd like you to do, go ahead. And uh, this is going to be the end of this video. Um, I'll leave this one up to you. I think it's a good exercise for you to try to write out these payoff matrices on your own first for each of the four and try to figure out are any of these possible laws incentive compatible or you know, is no law incentive compatible? Right. Uh, so go ahead, do that, and we will continue uh, working on this problem in class.